Um, second day of the conference uh, promises to be a very nice day as well. And um, we start with a great speaker, I must say, Rod Simpson. Um, he is a lot to start with. Um, he's an architect, urbanist. He um, was a um, social professor in the yeah. Yeah. Um, adjunct professor at UTS, and um, the Environment Commissioner of the Greater City Commission. And I showed you the three cities yesterday. So this is the, the father of that idea. <laughs> Many fathers. <laughs> Many fathers of that. Maybe three fathers. <laughs> Anyway, um, co-father of that, uh, that idea. So I know Rod for uh, oh, two years, I think, and uh, we worked together quite a, quite a lot, uh, which was always a pleasure. Um, and the feedback of the students we taught together is is uh, you know very rewarding. So we probably did something right. I, I don't know, but you can ju judge it yourself because Rod is going to talk to you about his uh, his work and his uh, philosophy and. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Enjoy. Okay. okay. I'm going to open up the presentation for you. Thanks very much, Rob. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Gadigal people. Um, and I pay, I'm sure we all, all joining me in paying my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Um, and Rob has asked me to um, talk about the relationship of indigenous culture to what we do. Uh, and actually, that's not asking me to do anything new because um, it's foundational to the work that I'm involved with. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, give you, a, it sounds as though Rob might have talked about the three cities yesterday a little bit. I won't be talking about that in great detail. Um, what I'm going to be putting forward is a proposition about, uh, it's a very simple proposition, actually, um, and I think Hopefully, it's strong because it is simple, and it's to do with the order in which we plan. And the way that we've been planning cities in the past has tended to start from transport, um, then thinking about the economy, uh, and then thinking about housing, and then lastly, of course, the impact that that planning might have on the national environment. And then if we go further back in history, if we think about the people who have been indigenous to place, um, we might start to draw from that beyond simply recognising it or acknowledging it as I have just done, but actually seeing it as the, the basis, the foundation for a, in fact reversing that sequence of planning. So perhaps a very simple idea, um, but I hope uh, through simplicity, uh, strong. So here it is for our international guests and interstate visitors. Uh, uh, this is Sydney. Um, you can see the scale there. Our area uh, of the Greater Sydney region is um, 12,000 square kilometres. Those are the five uh, districts, as we call them, that um, the Greater Sydney Commission is responsible for. Um, the urban footprint is around about 20% of that, 2,500 two square kilometres. And about half of it is, in fact, national parks. Um, the area in red, you might just burn that into your retina for a moment because I'm going to be talking quite a lot about that, that area. That's the catchment area of Wainamata or South Creek. Um, and you can see the three circles there which is representing the three cities. Now the growth in Sydney is very high, it's the highest in the OECD, it's highest in, in amongst the Western nations. Um, Sydney is going at the moment from 4.6 million up to 6.3 million by 2036 that will require around about another 725,000 dwellings um, and around about another 817,000 jobs. Um, in other words, very, very quick growth. There's a lot of pressure on our existing systems and this discussion at the moment, as you may be aware, of actually slowing down that growth because it's in fact very, very hard to even service what we have at the moment. Um, so here's the geography of Sydney. This is that 2,400 square kilometres of the urban area, roughly. And what these two maps show, um, these, these are two of probably 100, 200 maps we could produce, which all show pretty much the same thing. Which is that having come from the east and developed the city in the east around the harbour, 
having concentrated our infrastructure, transport, universities, a whole <coughs> range of infrastructure in the east, on the basis of building on strengths, reinforcing the strengths that we have in the city, at the very same time we may have also been entrenching disadvantage and entrenching weaknesses. Um, and so on the left what you see there is a combined index, this is the Australian index of social disadvantage, um, and red is, is bad. <laughs> Uh, so these are the places that have entrenched disadvantage across a whole range of issues in terms of education, <laughs> income, health, <laughs> right across the board. And here's another representation of the same sort of effect over on the right. This is the um, performance of schools um, with that line. Now that line in Sydney, in the local Sydney colloquial, is known as the latte line. So people to the northeast of that line drink lattes and those to the south of the line don't, or it might be called the smash avocado line. You hear those terms while you're in Sydney. It's a very much about a cultural divide as well, but that cultural <coughs> divide, of course, is, is really one of disadvantage. Now, the point is that, that those patterns have been developed and reinforced for 200 years, 230 years. And to counter that, there's been a decision to put in a, an airport in the west of the city, which I'm sure Rob talked about yesterday. And the point about that is that yes, there'd be 60,000 jobs around that airport, but really it's a massive investment in a piece of infrastructure that can be then leveraged to then direct further investment in terms of industry, agribusiness, logistics, uh, but also universities and a new way of thinking about development. Um, and the idea there also is to have uh, jobs of all sorts within 30 minutes even though those three cities may have different concentrations or focuses of jobs. In other words, it's leveraging this massive commitment to an airport, which has been talked about for decades, <laughs> probably from, well, from the early 1980s, so it's been talked about for almost 40 years. I mean, and I'm talking about the precise site for 40 years, not simply that there's another airport. <coughs> and finally, it's coming to pass. So there's major railways being planned and so forth. But the point is that it's not just about infrastructure, it's essentially a mechanism to rebalance the city and to start to address those inequities. So it's not, it's actually a social, it's actually a social objective more even than an economic one in a sense in terms of productivity, although of course there are productivity benefits, enough of that. So here are the three cities looking westward. This is the, the westernmost extent of the, what we call the eastern city. This is a Sydney Olympic Park, there's Parramatta, and out here is, is Penrith. This is a high point called Prospect Hill. Um, but I'll just run through the history of Sydney very briefly in about three minutes, <laughs> which is really just to see how, of course, this is orientated 90 degrees. So north is not up the page, west is up the page. And the reason that west is up that up to the top, because this is how, of course, when we think about moving into a place, as you saw on the previous slide, we've moved from the east westward. And in Sydney, what was found very early on was that the country in the east was infertile, sandstone country, and people moved very quickly out to the west where they found shale country, much more, fer much more fertile soils, and a very much more uh, soft undulating landscape, very different to the landscape that you've all seen throughout Sydney Harbour. Um, that blue line is the Hawkesbury. That's the defining limit of the Cumberland Plain, as it's known. And that white line is the catchment line. The significance of that is, of course, that all the water to the, up the page, if you like, to the uh, flowing westward, goes into that sensitive waterway. And the national parks that we have have not been a result of policy. I mean, it's just been pragmatics, to be honest, which is that it was undevelopable pretty much, too expensive to develop. Of course, overlaid with that then, of course, was the preservation of those national parks. But what you see here also, of course, in the east, was military reserves, swamps, uh, reclamation of land for open space, and port land reserved, which has actually provided an extraordinary amount of public domain. So there's South Creek, or Wyanamata, which means mother place in the local language. And there's the South Creek catchment. And I'll talk, be talking quite a bit about that catchment because this is essentially where the city will be expanding. Now, just passing by, in 1770, uh, Parkinson on Cook's voyage 
remarked that the landscape looked like plantations in a gentleman's park, which was one of the motivations for the British to then return in 1788, uh, because of course that parkland landscape was um, seen as a prime opportunity for a whole lot of cattle, <laughs> which you can see here. Well, of course, that actually didn't take into account was that this landscape was not a natural landscape. This was a managed landscape that had been carefully looked after stewardship, custodianship over tens of thousands of years. And I was going to say arguably, unarguably, the most stable economic social system that the world has ever known is the legacy that we had and was existent at that time. And so there's a recent book called The Biggest Estate on Earth because that's a conception of Australia being carefully managed with a sensitivity to what could happen where, if you like, an adaptive management system. Now I'm throwing that in at the moment because my main proposition, there's a few propositions I'm putting. One is that although we may not be able to draw a direct line between indigenous values and indigenous management, I think we can draw a direct line to think of an underlying ethos of stewardship and custodianship. And it may be that we can start to draw direct threads in terms of the pragmatic aspects of management. But I think that's probably stretching it too far too quickly. But if we think about how we actually manage an entire mosaic of complexity in the urban area, I think there's a lot to be said by simply observing uh, what was there before. Now, moving westward, um, what happened was, apart from those reserves in the east, what you see here is the expropriation of land from the Aboriginal communities and a re-handing back in terms of land grants from the Crown to private citizens, essentially. In other words, the entire west of the city was privatised. Right? The only thing that wasn't privatised are these green areas which were the commons that were reserved for stock. This is mainly by about 1820. Pretty much all the land had been taken away and privatised. A huge challenge when you think about it, now that we're thinking about expanding the city. A huge challenge because the attitude with which we moved into that country was one of exploitation. Um, this is not the early 1800s, this is the 1920s and 30s. This is still Griffith Taylor representing I think an attitude that probably persisted arguably up until the 1960s. And so really that's an extraordinary, an extraordinary map. You might also notice that the stuff that's really top quality, the solid black of the coal fields. But anyway, we won't go there quite yet. But of course that, what that totally ignored, here's another map which shows the difference. The area that's shown here of course is the uh, productive grasslands for Aboriginal cultivation. Not cultivation in the European sense, but managed areas of grassland that actually produced uh, grain across those same areas of identified as having very low value. And I'll be sharing the slides and so forth, so you don't need, I'm just letting you know, so you can relax. <laughs> um, what it meant was that when you look at the vegetation from 1788 to 1990, complete devastation in the west. You can see here also that rugged area of sandstone, which are the national parks, this is Karingai, this is Royal National Park in the south, the second national park in the world, as it happens. And then off to the, um, the west here on that diagram of the Blue Mountains, which isn't part of this mapping. That's what it looks like at the moment. Right? So you've got to imagine that as being, not necessarily covered by forest, but certainly covered by woodland that you saw a moment ago. A managed landscape that's essentially been devastated. Now we've called it the Western Parkland City. We've called it the Eastern Harbour City, the Central River City, and the Western Parkland City. And the choice of the word parkland is very deliberate because it recognises, like it or not, as we go into the Anthropocene, all landscapes are subject to human intention. So we have no choice but to think about how we now apply human intention to this landscape. The point being that the idea of returning it to an imagined wilderness would be flawed. It's disrespectful, it's not appropriate, and in fact it's impossible to do it because it doesn't take into account climate change for a start. So in other words, we've got real challenges because all of our legislative and institutional arrangements have essentially been set up to do what 
we've done to get to where we are to today, and we tend to be trying to accelerate those processes which are not fit for purpose and are actually going to lead us down the wrong track. So again, I'll return to my main proposition or question would be, can we change the order of planning? Can we change the basis from which we start to plan and in so doing, start to question some of these arrangements, um, some of these institutional arrangements that actually are driving us um, to the brink? Of course, I'll be saying yes. This is what I'm talking about when I say driving us to the brink. This is actually what's the current practice of what's being rolled out and being accelerated through improved processes to deliver more of this as quickly as possible in the West. I'm not even making a judgment, I'm just say, stating a fact here. So the question becomes, how on earth <laughs> did this become what it is and how did we get to this point? How did we get here? I think we got there through planning orthodoxies. So as a, a, an architect, as Rob's mentioned, moving into urban design, urban design practice is very dependent on precedence, on analysing different parts of different cities that exist which are good. And we look at somewhere like this, this is King's Cross, we're off the um, image up to the uh, top left by a couple of kilometres. But this is King's Cross, uh, here's the domain, there's the art gallery, this is the central business district of Sydney. And what you see here is a, com a complex organic form that's emerged over 200 years. And we look at these um, patterns, we can recognise them as being very walkable, dense, mixed use, able to absorb change, intensify over time, shift their economy. Um, in other words, very resilient places. We can analyse it, we can look at different street types, we can look at intersection uh, intensity, we can start to analyse these things and the overall proposition of a lot of urban design is that through understanding these pre precedents, we can actually project into the future to actually plan a desirable urban condition. And so when we look at some of these places, if you look at London and you can see here the, um, the squares of course, with the grand houses around the square, but then when we look a bit more closely we can see that there's actually an extraordinary mix of housing types. There's uh, commerce along the main roads, there's mews where servants lived. What you see here in fact is a dense mixed use form with a very finely calibrated arrangement of social class, but essentially driven by the fact that the main mode of transportation was walking. So again, if we then say, yes, if we've got some foundational principles here about what makes good urbanity, leaving aside the urban design aspect and the intricacies and the metrics and so forth, I would simply say, let's just start with walking. If something is walkable, it absolutely is both a test and an outcome of good urbanism. And so here you see the mixed use, the front of the house, the servants' quarters at the back, the mews and so forth. What we've tended to do then, as urban designers, is then say, how do we codify that? Now what I'm showing here is somewhere in Perth, and what you can see is two urban conditions. One dominant and one subordinate, I'd suggest. The subordinate one is in fact a textbook. The subordinate one is in fact new urbanism, drawing from the walkability and the things that we think are going to make a good urban place, counterposed by the real story, counterposed by the things that really drive the cities that we produce in Australia, which is car dominated and a geography of both retail and commerce, which is essentially very, very different to what we've just seen. So unfortunately, this little new urbanist exercise over here can only see, be seen to be as almost having a symbolic value because the overall structure of the city is has been, in fact been determined by a completely different set of parameters driven by car and driven by the needs of investors in major retail, as you can see here. So, you know, this, I mean, you've all seen it, right? This is the global condition we're looking at here. And this, on the other hand, is the idea that we can somehow counter that. Um, I don't know that the proof's in the pudding because this is actually that surface car parking. This is still, I'd suggest, very car dominated, in fact, in this new urbanist walkable neighbourhood. Um, and so I think what we've got to start to do is really challenge these orthodoxies because this is, in Australia, in Sydney, has been the dominant one. 
And here it is. This is the gospel. This is the Western Australian Livable Neighbourhoods uh, Manual. Uh, and what you can see here is the codification of all that analysis, not directly from King's Cross, but essentially the codification of the analysis of the idea of there being a lineage of urban design based on precedent and based, to give it its due, on walkability and so forth. But you've seen that in fact the dominant pattern, this may exist in some parts, but the dominant pattern is going to be car based and operating to satisfy a, a much larger coarse of grained economic geography. And when you look at the detail of this, what can you see? Well, very simply, you can see the idea is that transport determines the urban form, is that retail locates in the most accessible locations, that retail is equivalent to amenity and urban quality, and access to retail is the most important thing, that we have to have density to support transport, which is why you have this higher density along the major road, and you can see also that you don't intrude into that catchment, the transport catchment, by locating schools and parks within that magic 400 metre radius. And that you have the major open space as far as away as possible and not intruding into this density, this high density area. Um, where does all this come from? You're probably familiar with Central Place theory from Cristala. Uh, looking at really deconstructing, if you like, uh, in this case it was Poland, um, deconstructing what was a medieval hierarchy of centres and the way that different sizes of markets worked in Europe. That also influenced then the urban geographers, which essentially is a descriptive analysis of urbanism, which has been turned into normative approaches to how we design, is my, my point. And then when we look at Canberra, over here on the left, you can see the expansion of Canberra into a structure plan called the Y plan for obvious reasons. But you can also see a very finely calibrated hierarchy of centres from town, from the city to the town, to the, what was called a group centre or a district centre, to a neighbourhood centre. And accompanying that, of course, was then a very finely calibrated and um, quite rigid hierarchy of roads. In other words, hierarchical, the idea of the city as a machine, the idea of components, a functional city. Interestingly, five years before, we have, of course, Christopher Alexander arguing that a city is not a tree, it's not a hierarchical, it can't be broken into components, it's actually a complex, complex system, a network, it is not a tree. So it's interesting that five years before, in fact, the theory and uh, underpinnings of understanding of urbanism was being questioned. But here we have it, this is the built result. What you see here is really the built result of those clash of approaches. On the one hand, the big structuring roads. On the other, then the density located near those roads with the idea that then that would support public transport. I might <coughs> suggest that's not a great result. But what it is, it's a result of actually having separate planning and transport departments and not actually resolving some of these major conflicts between the different understandings of what makes good urbanism with an over concentration on transport because transport oriented development is the orthodoxy at the moment and th there's also the idea of integrated transport and land use planning which simply means that where there's transport there's density and I think it needs to be much more sophisticated than that but more importantly I'm questioning whether that's a reasonable starting point, and I'm arguing that no, it's not. It should be the end point, not the starting point. So back to Canberra. Um, this is Burley Griffin's work of genius <laughs> with Marion Marnie Griffin, his wife. Um, this is overlaying a, not simply a, a, a plan on a landscape. Uh, what it is doing is overlaying a conception of a new democratic ethos that he thought was emerging in Australia before anywhere else in the world. And if it's not just me saying that, that's why I've got all the words there, it's him saying that. <laughs> so when you read that, you don't have to read it all right now, but what he's saying is the only reason he entered the competition from Chicago for a competition in Australia that he never visited but could read the drawings in an extraordinary way and the surveys, was that he saw Australia as being the leader in the world for new democratic institutions and 
perhaps most importantly, the land system that was going to underpin Canberra was a leasehold system to avoid speculation by developers and private landowners. In other words, it was about the public good. And that's what this is about, because at the same time, of course, you had the idea of garden cities and Ebenezer Howard's ideas of how communities could actually <coughs> reinvest in the public domain. Now, that response to the landscape, even though it's been overlaid by car dominant patterns, even though it's been overlaid by those functional systems I showed a moment ago, has an extraordinary resilience because it was based on landscape. And that basis of landscape, the appreciation for landscape, was carried through in the 1970s to understand that they wouldn't be developing over the, the hills, that there would be these great landscape valleys and systems of open space, poetically called the National Capital Open Space System, very 1970s sort of terminology. It's not a system, it's not a plan, you know, it's not a, not, a, not a plan, it's a system. But that landscape system, of course, is what gives Canberra um, this enduring resilience and capacity to, I think, to absorb change. And you can see here also that it also is an intentional landscape. Yes, some of it was cleared, but before it was cleared, it was in fact a natural open woodland, largely grassland, with only dotted trees. That's not a, there's a bit of clearing in there, but not a lot of clearing. That was its natural condition because of the soil conditions there and the uh, climate. So what you see below is in fact an intentional landscape. It's a landscape that's been made to moderate or um, uh, mediate that natural landscape to make it very habitable for humans. And so there's the introduction of exotics and so forth. So it's, just, it's it unexchangeably a, a, a constructed parkland city also. And here you can see those examples of that interplay of uh, the landscape system with these hierarchical <coughs> understandings of centres and so forth. So when you look at Canberra, and here it is in a sort of diagrammatic form. The black areas are the urban areas. The green areas are that national capital open space system. And these are national parks around the outside. A transport planner would usually say, that's a disaster. It's fractured. There's no way you can service that with transport. And it's been difficult in Canberra because it has actually given precedence to cars. However, let's compare it to Helsinki. <laughs> it might seem like a weird comparison, but there it is at the same scale, just as fragmented. Similar sorts of attitudes to landscape and the natural environment. The difference is in policy and taxation regimes and in the way that there's been an investment in public transport. In other words, geography, topography, urban form can be overcome by policy and investment. We shouldn't see the physical layout of the city as being an absolute game stopper, if you like, in terms of transport. We simply have to decide that's what we want to do. And that's why I still think that there's a capacity for that to happen in Canberra. So when you look at these figures, and this is essentially an argument put by uh, the late Paul Mees in this wonderful book, Transport for Suburbia, which is arguing for much that case. And when you look at this, you can see that this is how they've overcome it. When you look down the bottom here, the cycling, 2.5% in Canberra, I think it's now about 3%, so this is a few years old, this data. It is increasing. But in Helsinki, it's 6%. And you think, hang on, let's look at the temperature. This is minus 7.4 degrees in the middle of winter. Now, either that 6% is an average of zero in winter and 12% in summer, but it's still double. So you see what I'm saying? I'm really arguing that the obsession that we've had with transport-oriented development and transport taking precedence over all other considerations in how we plan our cities, and then allowing retail and the economic geography to then determine where they want to locate in relationship to that transport might be questioned. How might, what if we had a different starting point? What if our starting points were the blue grid? After all, we're not going to be changing the entire topography and hydrology of the entire city. If that's then extended through the green grid, not just the repairing corridors, but the open space systems right up to the watershed, and what if underneath all of that we started to recognise the ochre grid, the indigenous grid, the values that are still there in the landscape? And the idea of the ochre grid is coming from the Government Architect's Office of New South Wales, and it's simply this um, value and proposition that if we care for country, it will care for us. 
and not in a very literal way, and it's something that we can just draw together and start to have as an underpinning ethos. Back to this image. Um, I've already talked now about the restoration of the, the country and so forth, uh, but the appreciation of how managed this country was is, is look, it's, probably, it's been known and appreciated um, by scholars probably for many years. Um, it's buried in settlers' journals and diaries and explorers' journals and diaries. I think it's fair to say that Dark Emu, the one in the middle there by Bruce Pascoe, is probably the first time these fragments of evidence have been drawn together into a quite popular book and represented back to the Australian populace to say, this was not terra nullius. This was not an unmanaged landscape. The fact that the categories of warfare, the fact that the categories of, of cultivation and so forth and land tenure were unrecognisable and unappreciated did not mean that it did not exist. And so what I'm suggesting here is that we can now start as in, a, in terms of a shared future, which is what we're being invited to do. It's not about a proprietorial sort of attitude that's being put forward by Aboriginal communities, but one of a shared future drawing on this lineage. There's an emergence that's happening with these various books that are, that are coming into the um, public consciousness. Um, and uh, for those of you who are not from Australia, you know, unlike uh, New Zealand, you know, where there was one indigenous language, we've got quite a few. Um, so even that makes things complicated. But when we start to look, and this is now out at South Creek again, Wyana Matter, uh, this project is starting to look at all the stories, not stories in a historical sense, not simply archaeological remains, but a layering of understanding of what this landscape can be. And so this Oka Grid project has a number of themes. Yes, it's about mapping country, it's about recording unrecorded history, which is what I've just talked about, because this is now starting to bubble up. Um, we may be able to use that to influence urban planning, recognising it as a living, living culture. This is just rattling off uh, what's in the Oka Grid. It's a, uh, a policy and thinking that's being developed, not current policy. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that from necessity, we might start to turn that into aspiration, and that really leads to this idea of custodianship. So here are those three cities. The Harbour City, the River City, which might be restored, and this Western Parkland City. And the importance of that is that what you see here is these are the floodplains. This is the possible maximum flood in the blue, and then the one in 100 flood in the purple. Uh, there it is there. This is Sydney Harbour rotated 90 degrees at the same scale. So the challenge is what sort of landscape would we want to have that has a different identity to the Eastern City, but is just as valued and just as um, cared for as the Eastern City. And this little blip in the middle is Lake Lily Griffin. <laughs> and when you think about Canberra, if any of you have been there, how essential that is to the identity of that city, it's artificial, it's artifice. So again, we have to decide, we have no choice but to imply, apply our intention to that landscape. And there it is again, just to remind you of just how devastated it is. What was there before along that alluvium was not just woodland, but alluvial forest that was going up to 30 metres high. These were massive trees. And here you can see just, it's an Aboriginal shield tree, which is still standing there in that, that area. There's a few. And so what I'm suggesting is that we are starting to move beyond our regulatory requirements for restoration of habitat. So this is actually the biodiversity commitments, extension of habitat, essentially a silo though when you think about it, not thinking about it as being an essential, maybe the skeleton, maybe the, the, the absolutely essential framework, the starting point, but we've got to extend that, not only physically, but also conceptually, because yeah, as I said, the, the idea that we can simply restore a landscape to a pre-existing condition without taking into account the stresses that are going to be placed on that by climate change is not going to be effective. So we're going to start messing up this legislation. You see what I'm saying? Because it's no longer about 
biodiversity. It's no longer about riparian vegetation to re re retain the geomorphology. It's no longer about open space planting. It's about no longer just about sort of street tree planting. It's seeing that as an absolutely integrated and extensive system. And here's the restoration that's possible. Uh, an example from Fairfield 20 years ago, 10 years ago, two years ago, what's possible in the central river city. <coughs> so we've got a green grid. We've started to introduce that into our planning. Here you can see the biodiversity. But the challenges that moving into that catchment are, it is a different catchment. It's a different climate zone in terms of, I mean, everyone in this audience will know what the hell I'm talking about. So in terms of our uh, thermal modeling for building performance, the east and the west of the city are actually different climate zones in terms of our uh, building modelling. That's already the case. And then we add on cl changing climate, we can be uh, in a seriously different condition. Here's the 1948 plan, and what you can see here is there's that catchment line. There's that catchment, and you can see we've pretty much avoided going into it. And the reason we've avoided going into it is that the, the creek quality, and that this might look attractive to the general public, but anyone here would know that that's a degraded street. That's a degraded bank that's unstable and is going to release nutrients into uh, the river system with the first major flash flood, run. And there's the result from a few years ago. So we know that we have to manage all that much better. At the moment, we don't have a coordinated overall catchment management. We don't have a connected uh, regime for diffuse source pollution and point source solution for sewage treatment plants and so forth. In other words, the governance, in other words, the stewardship for the whole landscape actually doesn't exist. And again, there's that reference <coughs> I'd make back to the idea of a landscape scale stewardship that's needed. We still see the flooding and the, the way we handle water as either being a threat in this case, which is the detention basins, not as being part of a living system. Um, we're moving beyond that. So this is just an indication of some of the more um, joined up thinking that is actually starting to happen across a number of catchments in Sydney. The ability to model in very fine detail, not just the flooding, but also nutrient loads, which may allow us to then trade nutrients, have a, essentially a nutrient trading scheme across the subcatchments. And then we can model it and we can start to think about how urban forms might be different in this place to be more um, uh, sensitive to, to the uh, receiving waters and the limits to the loads of nutrients we can put into those. But then we come to heat. So the west of the city is already hotter. It's hotter for a number of reasons. One is that the cooling northeasterly breezes don't go much past this line. You can see again, my God, this is the heat. It's the Larde line again. <laughs> Right? I mean, just coincidentally, it's also the people who are the least able to withstand this extreme heat are in fact in the areas which are going to be subject to it. But it gets worse, because what's going to happen in the future is because the weather becomes more energised, if you like, those w easterly winds will penetrate further to the west, but the westerly winds will also be stronger, which is the continental heat. And that will actually have the effect of forcing the heat up into that superheated bubble up here, where it's actually contained by the topography. We're talking about a, probably 13 degrees hotter than this area over in the east in the middle of summer. We're talking getting close to 50 degrees centigrade. What can we do about that? Everyone will say, plant more trees. Great, trees take 20 years. Trees at 46 degrees start to stop, shut down. The mallets close up. Some trees die after a few hours of stress at 46 degrees. So greenery without water isn't going to cut it. Greenery, water, cool materials, and then we've got to think about the resilience in terms of photovoltaics, localised storage, in order for people to be able to afford and run air conditioning so that the mortality is actually kept at acceptable levels because the projections are it will go up by about a six-fold factor. So what am I saying? I'm saying, you can see here, greenery, water, photovoltaics, that's a system. It's no longer the silos. So as we move into this, as we move into this catchment, what I'm saying is the necessity of thinking differently is unavoidable. Right? It's absolutely essential that things are going to be done differently. So no longer are we thinking about building standards, greenery, canopy. You get my point. We're talking about a systems approach to how we design those urban areas. 
And this is just chasing through recycled water. You can pick, you can pick whatever you like. I could put photovoltaics in that first, first little circle there and then chase through the consequences. And of course, this is, not, this is a multi-dimensional system we're talking about here if you draw all the connections and so on. And the way, of course, the way you deal with that is through the understanding that Christopher Alexander had back in 1965, which was thinking about lattices and thinking about not trying to necessarily take it down to this atomistic analytics, but seeing it as assemblages and patterns which can be put together. In other words, whole joined up propositions about urbanity that can essentially be distributed through that landscape. And so what we started to talk about is an urban mosaic. Yes, intentionally a reference to landscape mosaics, and yes, intentionally a reference to the mosaic burning of land management that was carried out by Aborigines. Language terminology is important. We're, we're really trying to get terminology that starts to resonate in a number of ways. So an urban mosaic, it's complex. If we approach the city as a mosaic, we can start to understand these different urban typologies. What we've done here is actually then model all of the um, CO2 reductions that can, be resu can result from a whole range of interventions. Um, this is then the reductions that are possible, not only in new land release areas, which you see over here on the right, but in these different urban conditions that exist in the existing city. No great surprises here where there's the greatest change, there's the greatest opportunity to achieve massive carbon reductions, building performance, waste, uh, energy systems and transport systems. And here's just to understand that behind that mapping are all these interventions to understand where we might intervene. So back to um, canopy cover. What it starts to suggest is that we have an adaptive management system. We are not going to set up a ministry for canopy. We're not going to set up a ministry for riparian vegetation. We don't need to. What we're involved with is setting, about, setting up the outcomes that we want. In other words, the policy, we're developing the plans, but there's going to be many people involved in the implementation of that plan. It's not about controlling hierarchical organisations. It's about communicating information to the right people at the right time to inform their individual decisions and to be able to accumulate that knowledge upward to know whether the entire city is actually on track or not to these high level outcomes. And that's, that's, that's adaptive management. And that's again, I think by extension, a reference back to indigenous management of an entire <coughs> landscape. So the breakthrough practice, um, breaking through current practice, I think is our greatest challenge. Um, and what we've done, very simple diagrams is, uh, again, and I'm not gonna apologize too much for them, but they're very graphic because they've got to communicate to everyone. And so we've simply said, look, let's start with that landscape. Let's start by questioning the new urbanist thing of the density near transport and put the density near the greatest amenity where people can both care for the landscape and appreciate it. The transport can follow. We don't have to run roads on ridges anymore. Amazing. <laughs> so we can actually reverse the entire sequence of planning. Blue, green, density for amenity, commerce, then transport. And this is what we're talking about. I mean, it's pretty simple stuff. It happens elsewhere in the world. This is outside Helsinki, starting with the water systems, starting with the greenery, starting with the walking systems, and then, yes, of course, ensuring you can still deliver a fridge. Um, the Finns are unbelievably um, <laughs> honest with themselves. <laughs> this little comment I don't think we'd have in Australia, where someone is allowed to have this comment on the front cover of the report. <laughs> a little bit too child-oriented, but still quite OK. The point I'm making is that this is the way we've been achieving density in Sydney and by contrast we can still achieve the same sort of density with this much more heterogeneous and mixed and much more sensitive sort of urban form. So, last few slides. There's current practice, you've seen the diagram before. There it is from 12 years ago. Here it is from two years ago and you've seen what it looks like when it's built. There's the basic proposition of business as usual. And all I'm saying is, what about if we start with the water systems, design the open space systems, think about where we locate community facilities, make sure that they're linked up by walkable <coughs> networks that are safe for cyclists and the least able to afford <coughs> home. 
make that system work, locate then the density and commerce in relationship to those schools and open space systems, locate the density with the highest amenity, and still achieve the transit patronage layouts that we require to get the transport systems. They are not incompatible. It's just that we reverse the whole system. And who knows, we might end up with more stuff which should make the developers happy. So, it's the last slide. That's my proposition. Start with the landscape. Walk country and actually start to take that in. And when I say walk country, you can see when, when we're all walking country, we're seeing geomorphology, we're seeing the capacity of receiving waters, we're seeing where the winds are coming from, we're looking at vegetation. That's what I mean by walking country. What Aboriginal communities were able to do without all of our science, we now can do, I think, with them by taking in that science. An urban mosaic, shared custodianship, in other words, adaptive management. We'll leave it at that. Happy to take any questions and even better, question my proposition. <laughs> Well, uh, yesterday we, uh, we ended with uh, Nimish, uh, who, uh, who was not uh, uh, looking for questions, but for answers. So <laughs> maybe that's... Uh, well, I know, maybe, is, is this an uh, answer? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, Stephen, you know uh, Yes, uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, really appreciate your presentation. It was uh, uh, really good to see that perspective coming through um, from our planning approaches. My question relates to land ownership and your point about um, how Canberra was a leasehold approach. Um, are you tackling that issue? Because that tends to be where the whole program tends to un unravel when you know, people own, uh, have that ownership and, um, and then aren't able to deliver the infrastructure, so the, the, the link between ownership and delivery of infrastructure. Yeah, look, um, okay, at this point I need to say I I'm speaking uh, in a personal capacity, not, in, not, not, not as government policy. Okay. So what I, well, why I'm here, yes, I've been showing you some of the, the thinking, let's say, that's happening inside government, um, but I'm aware it's being recorded and so forth. So I'm uh, sorry to be so you know, officious about it, but um, I think I can also say that, yes, there's a recognition this has been a problem. I think I can also say that um, not just in New South Wales, but across Australia, the idea of green infrastructure being essential infrastructure is something that's starting to come up. Now, why I say that is because as soon as you start changing those definitions, it means that different pieces of regulation and legislation can apply. So in New South Wales, for example, and I'm not saying this is what's being proposed, but just to illustrate it, um, local government can charge rates and can charge uh, initial contributions from developers or from, from development on what's called essential infrastructure, usually roads, acquisition of open space for recreation and so forth. If we start to recognise uh, streams, green infrastructure, and now I mean green infrastructure in terms of vegetation and trees and street trees and the whole lot. That's pretty significant because what it means is that then a street tree becomes an asset on the asset register which is then part of the entire assets that council has responsibility for. Now that's one aspect. In terms of the actual land acquisition, um, that's, that's a huge difficulty. I'm, I, there's, no, there's no easy answer to that as you'd probably be aware. But again, I think it's important to recognise that um, in urban design, back to the very beginning of my talk when I started talking about precedence, I think it's all too easy to take a physical form and then think, that's lovely, we should have one of those. <coughs> so in the case of Helsinki, without at the same time recognising the institutional arrangements, the, in, even to the extent of the deep culture, if you like, of those institute, where those institutional arrangements came from, the legal frameworks and so forth, might mean it's absolutely impossible to simply transplant it. So it's, I think that's, I think, a weakness in the way that a lot of urban design is taught and practised, that it's actually held up as being simply a cookie-cutter sort of exercise. Thank you.
So, um, for example, uh, in Finland, uh, you have, as I understand it, rights of access across all land. In fact, rights of collecting firewood <laughs> and camping, uh, which is deep culture. Right? Um, I think the limitation is you're not meant to, be going, meant to go up to someone's house and look in their window, which is sort of pushing you know, that's part over the boundary. But similarly, if you look at in, in England, um, when there's uh, the identification of a project and then there's compensation, so there might be then purchasing of land or a property for a major public um, project. Uh, in England, there's a thing called the project date. In other words, a minister might have a thought bubble one night and then talk to the press the next day and then say, we're going to do X, Y, Z. That's going to have an effect on property values. And so that's called the project date. And so the property values are actually benchmarked to that time. Different in New South Wales, probably different in Victoria. But those things are where this, this is the real this is the real rub. Right? This is this is this is where our processes, what I said at the very beginning, I think it's one of the things I'm referring to. It's where the processes and our institutional arrangements, our legal frameworks and so forth, are not fit for purpose. So that's got to be resolved. We've got to work out a way through that. And there's no simple answer, you're absolutely right. But the thing about the thing about the um, the reason largely why there aren't vast tracts of open space systems running through Western Sydney that are owned by local government is because of that definition that's not seen as essential infrastructure. So the trunk drainage is then owned by Sydney Water, which is a state corporation. So you see what I'm saying? It's going to get very, very boring because we've got bits of legislation that need to be bolted together in different ways. Um, and in, in, a, in, a, in innovative ways as well. So in fact, the design challenge is quite often an institutional legal design challenge as much as a physical design challenge. Before you start your second lecture, uh, uh, Dominique <laughs> has also a question. Um, I was really uh, heartened by your comment that uh, you know we have the most stable social, ecological, and economic system on Earth for over 40,000 years, and it's time we started listening to that. Um, we're working on a project called Modern Custodianship where we bring that knowledge but don't privilege it and we bring modern knowledge together and you investigate mm. what's the path forward. Mm. My question is, um, how does that not sound like we're colonialising that 40,000 years worth of history and wisdom? Because that's the most, one of the reasons why it's more important to listen than speak at the moment in that space, but there's also emergency. So. Uh, again, I'll stress this is my personal view. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, stop the recording. <laughs> no, no, it's okay, but I'm just making it clear. Um, look, I, I think we're talking about two completely incommensurable and incompatible systems. And I think that the idea is, I think you're suggesting, it's not a matter of appropriating knowledge and then using that in an instrumental way. I think in Australia we've got things to do with, in New South Wales we have Land Rights Act and so forth, which is explicitly about uh, granting land to in Indigenous communities for economic development. I mean, it's in the legislation. That's, and that's in order for them to have self-determination and to have an economic base founded on land <coughs> ownership, which is the, you know, basically the British or the Australian system. And so that's the foundations and that makes quite a lot of sense. But I think that the what has to happen is that there's a greater a greater appreciation that there's, there's fundamental values and uh, I'd call it an ethos that can't be reconciled. It simply can't, we can have reconciliation in some forms, but we're talking about completely different systems. And I think we should value the fact that they are completely different and one cannot easily and nor should it be, should there be any attempt to morph it, modify it, fit it into the other system, which I think is what everyone tends to think, that we should somehow draw from that and then fit it in. So I think that, um, I personally think that uh, a, a recognition and respect for and um, desire to retain the integrity, if you like, of another uh, layer of meaning and understanding of land doesn't have a direct instrumental transfer into our system, but may very well serve as 
almost a spiritual ethos that, that then underpins everything we do. Without it trying to be direct, without it trying to be trans... Does, I, does that make sense? I mean, I, I just think that these two systems are so different. I mean, I mean, I'd use the example, say, of the um, comparing it, if you like, in term, as an intermediate with the Maori sort of land tenure systems, because it is, in a way, a, a, an intermediate form. So here we've got the British system with, you know, private land ownership or crown ownership. There's cadastral systems. There's titling systems. Okay, that's the system. Individual ownership of land. New Zealand land ownership <laughs> by the iwi or the tribe but not individual ownership, but a very, very well-defined geographic extent of that land, quite defined. In Australia, networks of moiety and, and uh, association and family groups, which were incredibly fluid and not geographically defined. The fact that we've got land councils with cadastrally defined boundaries is an imposition of our system on a landscape that was never conceived like that, with the exception perhaps of rivers and so forth. But those rivers were not dividing places, they were joining places, they were places where people came together. So, you know, you can see what I'm saying, that there's that those two, those different systems are completely uh, incommensurable, I think I'd put it that way, um, and therefore possibly incompatible and therefore deserving of um, respect and uh, retaining some sort of integrity rather than trying to perhaps mangle it into something <coughs> else. Does it believe it? Completely agree with all of that, but not the answer for how do we bring them together. And we, how, how do we move forward? But there is, I, I haven't found an answer to that. So well, I think, I, think that, um, I think that you, I mean, we have, well, one thing is to ask Aboriginal groups what they want, obviously, which is what we're also doing. And I think I can say that, that um, as far as working within our system with the Land Rights Act and so forth, with the local Aboriginal land councils, their focus is on leadership, economic development and social wellbeing. It's not necessarily on the uh, cultural aspects and the ethos. Look, just a few weeks ago someone said to me, right, don't talk to us about preserving our culture. Our culture is fine. You know, we can look after ourselves, thanks very much. <laughs> You know, you don't need to worry about that. <laughs> what you need to worry about is allowing us to <laughs> get on. So, I mean, I think there's also that, you know. So it's, um, I don't think Aboriginal groups necessarily are waiting around for us to, uh, you know, for all of us to sort of design some sort of system that absorbs everything into ours. I think it's that moving forward together in a, in a loose way, as I'm suggesting, without being too close, perfectly aligned. Maybe this is, it's also, uh, an ongoing discussion yeah. of, of finding what is to where you can join up and to where different uh, rules respect needs to happen. So that, and that we don't know, probably. Uh, back to it. <laughs> My proposition, very simply, is that if if you start with the water systems, and if you then go back and you start with understanding, first of all, what were those historic patterns and so on. If you start with the soils, if you start with the water systems and go through that, it's the exact opposite, right? I mean, that's, it's a simple proposition, but if you do it and you really, really take that seriously, I think it's a fundamental change. It will cut through the orthodoxies, it will cut through the institutional silos because, very simply, you're asking people to do something differently. And as soon as you do that, that's where these tensions come, because it's not the way we've done it yesterday, and it's where all those processes need to be questioned. So it's quite, uh, it's very disruptive. Yeah. It's very exciting. But pushing your boundaries means that you were on the right track to change. So, um, to cite you, basically. Uh, thank you very much, Rod, for your great talk. No, thanks. Um, thanks absolutely fantastic. And, uh,